Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fourth session in the doula and perinatal community health worker and Medicaid virtual learning series. Uh, my name is Yanti Wheeler, the health policy and research assistant at the Institute for Medicaid Innovation. I wanna begin by thanking our partner, Every Mother Counts, as well as our funder, the Community Acceler Health Acceleration Partnership for their commitment to advancing important perinatal health topics in the Medicaid population. We are able to offer this free learning series because of their generous and ongoing support. Um, this learning series includes eight monthly one hour Zoom sessions. The topics will address relevant policy issues with pre session materials, supplemental resources, and invited subject matter experts. As a refresher, the link to today's pre session materials have been placed in the chat for you or will be placed. Um, sessions are recorded and will be archived on the IMI website. All attendees are automatically muted. The chat feature is disabled. However, we have some time at the end of the session for you to ask questions for our guest speakers. To participate in this discussion with the speakers, please use the Q&A feature to submit questions and comments. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the session. Since we have such a robust presentations from each of our three presenters and moderators, we may run out of time to answer all of the participant questions during this live session. Any unanswered questions will be consolidated and shared with our presenters and project team after today's session and we will send out responses with the post-session materials. At the completion of this session, you will receive an email message with a link to complete a short three-minute feedback survey. As a reminder, completion of the survey is required as part of your participation in the learning series. We actively review and incorporate your feedback into future sessions. We really look forward to hearing your thoughts. Finally, all materials, including the session and slides, session recording and slides, will be available to you on the IMI website about two weeks after the session. We also hope you will stay all the way to, to the end of the session because we're gonna be administering a poll about topics for session seven and eight. Today's learning objectives include um, identifying the landscape of Medicaid coverage for community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers on a state-by-state -state basis, interpret policy levers, strategies, and solutions for states, different stages of Medicaid reimbursement implementation for community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers. And lastly, identify examples of partnerships that improve how state Medicaid programs operationalize reimbursement for community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers. And once again, before we hear from our speakers for this session, I wanna to continue to acknowledge the importance of avoiding the temptation to place the burden of addressing all maternal health inequities solely on the shoulders of doulas and perinatal community health workers. And as I've stated every session before this, access and coverage to doula and perinatal, perinatal community health worker services in Medicaid is just one element of a multi-pronged approach that is needed to support system-wide transformation. So for this session, we are super excited to have Amy Chen as our moderator. Amy is the senior staff attorney of the National Health Law Program, where she works on reproductive and sexual health law policy and advocacy. And she has led the National Health Law Program's doula Medicaid project since 2019. Before we begin our panel discussion, Amy will provide a brief overview of the landscape of Medicaid coverage throughout the US. For more information, we encourage participants to review the pre-session material where there are maps and resources related to this national scan. All right, Amy, take it away. Great, thanks, Yanti. Um, so my name is Amy Chen. My pronouns are she, her. I'm so happy to be with you all today. And as Yanti um, said, uh, I'm gonna just start us off with a quick overview of um, kind of a state of states and where we are in terms of Medicaid uh, uh, Medicaid implementation uh, implementation of state coverage um, of doula care. So you can see here, this is an image that and help commission from illustrator MJ Smith that says all pregnant and postpartum people deserve access to full spectrum doula care. Um, our doula Medicaid project launched in May 2019. As part of the project, just in terms of a quick introduction, we really work to help expand access to doula care for Medicaid enrollees by supporting doulas, maternal health, um, health policy advocates, and other stakeholders across the country. Um, our focus is on expanding access to full spectrum doula care, which includes doula support not just for prenatal, postpartum, and labor and delivery, but for all the ways in which a pregnancy can end, including abortion, miscarriage, and stillbirth. I also want to note that here at the National Health Law Program, we are lawyers, we're researchers, and we're policy advocates. We're not doulas. As such, we've always sought to do all of our work in partnership with and with the guidance of community doula groups, doula collectives, and individual doulas, especially doulas representing those groups most impacted by disparities in care, um, including Black doulas and Black-led doula groups, as well as doulas and doula groups who um, are already serving low-income clients. 
Next slide, please. So the doula Medicaid project first began tracking the national landscape of doula and doula Medicaid related legislation in 2019. Since that year, there's really been a steady increase in bills that are introduced and passed each year. Um, in addition to tracking state bills, legislation and other efforts, we also provide support and technical assistance to doulas and state advocates across the country who are working on implementing Medicaid coverage for doula care or expanding access to doula care in other ways in their states and region. Um, I also want to stress that there's also a growing interest in supporting expanding access to doula care at the federal level as well, including um, with the Biden administration. So in June 2022, the White House released a blueprint for addressing the maternal health crisis, which included among its goals, one around expanding and diversifying the perinatal workforce, including doulas. Um, also in December 2022, the HHS Office of Health Policy released an evidence review of doulas and maternal health, which concluded that expanding access to doula care could help address racial racial disparities in maternal health outcomes, particularly if implemented with equity in mind and coupled with other initiatives to improve maternal health. Um, so super exciting to see that there is a lot of interest um, on this topic, both at the state level and at the federal level. So you can see here, um, this is a map of the United States and it's color coded. Um, I, I can I can share with you all that as of March, 2023, over half of all states, um, a total of 28, are taking some action towards Medicaid coverage for doula care. That includes either states that have implemented, states that are in the process of implementing Medicaid coverage for doula care, or states that are taking some adjacent action, um, such as you know a bill around doula certification or maybe convening a doula advisory board. Um, just really quickly, um, I'm not going to go through every single state here, but you can see the states with the little red stars are those states that are currently actively providing coverage. Um, so the, mo the two most recent states are both California and Michigan began coverage um, on January 1st, 2023, so just January 1st of this year. Of course, the two states that have had Medicaid coverage for doula care for quite some time are Oregon and Minnesota. Um, Florida began coverage in 2019, interestingly, when doula services were included um, as an expanded benefit. Um, just a couple of the other states to highlight here. New Jersey passed legislation in 2019, um, and the benefit began uh, began formally on January 1st, 2021. Um, Nevada, uh, Nevada passed legislation in 2021, and the benefit began um, just last year, April 2022. Um, let me see. Um, in Maryland, they began coverage also last year in February 2022 as part of um, a maternal and child health care initiative that was later made permanent um, under legislation that was that was passed last year. Um, Rhode Island is the only state in the country that currently has a doula care, both in Medicaid and private insurance plans. That was legislation that was passed in 2021. Um, and uh, sorry, that was legislation that was passed in 2021. And um, the Medicaid benefit rolled out in July 2022. Um, Virginia also, Virginia and Washington, D.C. Um, both also um, began benefits, uh, began benefits last year in 2022. Um, the states that you see in yellow are states that are currently at various stages of implementing um, coverage. So Connecticut, um, Illinois, Massachusetts, Ohio, um, and then also most recently, um, Pennsylvania is actually also um, doing some work. There's a Pennsylvania doula commission that's working with the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services to um, to try to uh, draft something and they anticipate starting coverage in 2023. Um, and then I'm not going to go through these states, but another 13 states are taking some adjacent actions such as legislation related to ultimately implementing Medicaid coverage for doula care, maybe convening dual advisory boards or doula stakeholder groups. Um, and I know I went through that really quickly. There's actually a, a blog post that we have on our website that um, I can maybe put in the chat or, or maybe someone can put in the chat. Um, and this was published in November of last year that kind of does an over review of all these states and provides a description of kind of what's happening in each of those states as well. Next slide. So I want to point out a couple of few, uh, you know, a few interesting trends that we can kind of keep our eye on as of, um, you know, March 2023. First, I'm seeing really a growing number of states that are being more thoughtful about achieving a sustainable and equitable reimbursement rate. I'm sure this is something that we're going to be talking about um, for the rest, uh, you know, throughout the rest of our conversation with the panelists as well. I would say this follows on the heels of Rhode Island implementing a $1,500 Medicaid reimbursement rate starting in July 2022. Um, and then Oregon newly implementing also a $1,500 Medicaid reimbursement rate. Um, this was after 
um, after having a reimbursement rate for many years of, of 350. Um, recently, also, as I mentioned, you know, last year, Washington, D.C. implemented Medicaid coverage for doula care. Thus far, it has the highest reimbursement rate. This is for people who use all, um, you know, if all 12 of the prenatal and postpartum visits are utilized, as well as the labor and delivery, the reimbursement rate is up to 1950. Um, and my hope going forward really is that um, more states will really be looking at the 1500 or the 19, um, you know, the 1950 as a starting point for the reimbursement rates and hopefully even go up from there. Um, second point, I'm really seeing an increase in efforts to expand access to doula care in the private insurance context as well. As I mentioned at present, there's only one state, Rhode Island, that requires um, both Medicaid and private health insurance plans to cover doula care. Again, this was passed in 2021, um, you know, and both of those were passed together, both Medicaid coverage and private insurance at the same time. Um, this year, legislators in several states introduced bills that require or encourage private plans to cover doula care, um, including bills in California, Massachusetts, it's Missouri, New York, um, Virginia. Uh, we actually have a forthcoming um, publication that will provide more details about some of these efforts and the proposed legislation in each of those states. Um, and I will say, I, I think just to call out Rhode Island, you know, talking with um, doulas and other state advocates on the ground in that state, you know, they they said to me that that the reason why they were really pushing initially for that bill to be both Medicaid and private insurance is because um, they know that when we're looking at maternal mortality and morbidity rates, particularly for Black pregnant and birthing people, those rates, um, you know, those rates stay the same regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless um, of income, regardless of education. And so if we're looking at really addressing uh, maternal health uh, you know, maternal health disparities um, and race equity, we really need to look at um, solutions such as expanding access to doula care across the board and not just for um, low income populations. Um, and then third, you know, many of the states that have implemented or are implementing Medicaid coverage for doula care. Um, in a lot of these states, I've also seen the growth or emergence of doula groups, doula co-ops, associations, you know, some sort of um, self-organizing that doulas are doing on the ground to really help alleviate some of the burden that it entails to become a Medicaid provider. Um, obviously, there's a lot of bureaucracy, paperwork, billing challenges, um, you know, understanding Medicaid coding that's involved with Medicaid billing and reimbursement. And many doulas are, they're just going to be new to Medicaid as a system. Many of them are finding that they need support, not just to navigate the system and to enroll, but also really to be successful going forward and seeking reimbursement as Medicaid providers. Um, you know, my sort of hope and recommendation is that doulas in, in states that are implementing coverage um, find the experts and support that they need to really self-organize. And the reason I say this is because, you know, my concern is, is that if they don't self-organize, my concern, and I think what, um, you know, I've seen happen in some cases is that others are going to organize for them on their behalf, right? Um, you know, once Medicaid starts reimbursing for doula services, then for-profit companies, many of whom might not even be well-versed in doulas or even maternal health, but maybe are versed in how to talk to and, you know, how to talk to health plans and insurance companies might come in, enter into contracts with those health plans and insurance companies, and then possibly push out the ability for state-based doula groups to really take their matters into their own hands. So I really want to encourage doulas and states to get organized, and it's never too early um, to start those efforts. And then lastly, I just want to point out, um, uh, I just want to point out just a couple of recommendations, sort of overarching recommendations for advocates, doulas, and other stakeholders who are looking to do this work in their state. And I think we'll probably maybe come back to some of these points as well throughout the rest of our discussion. First, I really encourage states to try to get this right from the beginning so that they don't have to do a lot of cleanup on the back end. Um, you know, both Minnesota and Oregon have had Medicaid coverage for doula care for quite some time, but have had to pass numerous bills over the years to fix or improve upon their original legislation, including, for example, changes to the billing structure and increases to the reimbursement rate. So I think states really have an incentive to be thoughtful and to craft equitable, sustainable, and inclusive programs for Medicaid coverage for doula care from the start. Um, second, I really encourage legislators, doulas, policy advocates, and community members who will be implementing Medicaid coverage for doula care to make sure that at every step in the process, community-based doula groups um, and groups that are already serving low-income um, low-income clients are and, and those who are already serving um, pregnant and postpartum people who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color are really front and center, not just in providing input and feedback, but really helping to craft the policy language and really helping to craft and figure out and determine 
um, how those policies are being implemented. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a doula. And so even with our own work with the doula Medicaid project, we've always sought to do that work in partnership with and with the guidance of doulas. Um, I think many state Medicaid agencies have really struggled with this piece. And I don't think, you know, it's not, I think, for lack of intent, but in some cases, I think just lack of experience working in real partnership with stakeholders in that way. Um, third, and this echoes, I think, what Yanti said in, in the introduction as well, you know, as firm as my faith is in the power of doulas to positively impact the lives of their clients, I also know that in the end, we can't put it all on their backs, right? Doulas can help mitigate the impacts of racism of their clients of color by advocating for them in the face of individual institutional and structural racism. But in the end, that racism is still going to be there harming other people. Um, so doulas may be necessary, but they alone are not sufficient. Um, so as we do this work, we must really remember this and remember and continue to work in other ways to seek out and eradicate racism in all its forms. Um, so I know that was a lot for me. I'm really excited to hear from the other panelists. Um, so, oh, great, perfect. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce a really terrific lineup of panelists. Um, we have Sarah Hoden Krinsky, um, Krinsky from Mass Health. We have Renee Malo from the California Department of Healthcare Services, and we have Missy Cheney from Oregon State University. We are placing a link to all of the speakers' bios in the chat. And now I'm going to pass it on to Sarah for her presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm here today to talk about the Mass Health Dual Services Program that we're hoping to launch here in Massachusetts. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. A little bit of background on Mass Health. Um, so, Mass Health is Massachusetts' combined Medicaid program and Children's Health Insurance Program, which is often referred to CHIP. We we cover about 40% of births in Massachusetts, which ends up being roughly 26,000 births per year, give or take. Um, the vast majority, more than 90% of our pregnant, birthing, and postpartum members are in some sort of managed care plan, um, so maybe an accountable care organi organization or an, uh, a managed care organization of another kind. We provide full benefits to pregnant members through 12 months following the end of pregnancy who would otherwise be eligible for this coverage regardless of immigration status. And I'll add to um, that when we think about 12 month postpartum coverage, that actually applies regardless of how that pregnancy ends. Um, you get 12 months of post-pregnancy coverage, if you will, through Mass Health. And then finally, we are seeking to improve the health outcomes of our diverse pregnant and birthing members and their babies by providing equitable access to high quality healthcare services and supports. Next slide, please. So I'm really excited to tell all of you, um, we are planning in late 2023 um, to begin covering doula services as a benefit for all of our mass health members during pregnancy, birth, and through the 12 month postpartum period. Just highlighting some of the, the key activities to date, um, and I think we'll get a little bit more detail in the Q&A and discussion later, but um, some of the key activities include doing some basic research, reviewing the robust literature on Medicaid coverage of doulas, best practices, um, things like the Advancing Birth Justice Report have been absolutely uh, essential for us. Discussions with other state Medicaid agencies that cover doulas. Amy just talked about um, the fact that there are several states that have already implemented Medicaid coverage of doulas. So we've really been leaning on other states and really trying to, to glean lessons learned from them as we put as we prepare to implement our benefit. Operationally, there's so many pieces to this, but a couple of highlights. Um, we are preparing right now to promulgate regulations and submit a state, pla state plan amendment or SPA, sometimes it's called, to CMS. And then there's tons and tons of um, aspects of systems readiness, getting ready for implementing doulas, um, the claims and billing pieces, et cetera. And then finally, probably, one of the most important aspects of our work has really been around stakeholder engagement. Um, Mass Health has held several public listening sessions, and we have, we plan to have at least one more, potentially uh, more than that. We also had a public request for information to um, solicit input from doulas, healthcare providers, um, really anyone from the public to help us in our policy development. And then finally, we've also had close collaboration with 
our state's Department of Public Health, including participating in their doula partner advisory group. Next slide, please. So in terms of some of the key lessons learned um, for successful doula programs under Medicaid, and these are lessons, there could be so many more, but I think these are some of the, the highlights. Um, these are lessons that we've learned not only from other states, but in talking to stakeholders, including doulas. The first is that training or certification requirements should reflect the diversity of the doula workforce and the fact that we all know doulas come into this work through a variety of ways, whether that's one of the many, many training programs that are out there through experience as opposed to more formal training, et cetera. Second, community-based doulas who reflect the birthing people they serve and have the skills to meet their needs are the most impactful. Third, doulas need support with the administrative processes of becoming a Medicaid provider and getting paid. Fourth, reimbursement rates are an essential component of a successful doula program under Medicaid, as Amy was talking about. And then finally, engagement with communities, healthcare providers, and other stakeholders about doulas is key to success. Um, and that was just a high level overview of what we're doing, but looking forward to sharing more during the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sarah. We also look forward to hearing more about the processes in Massachusetts during the Q&A section. Um, next, we'll hear from Renee Mallow. Thank you so much. And I'm very happy to be here today to talk about our journey here in California. Next slide, please. So we started on this journey because we, again, like other states, wanted to help reduce disparities and improve birth outcomes for our birthing populations of color here in California. Our Medi-Cal program today serves about 15 million individuals, and we do under our Medicaid program, which is called Medi-Cal, we cover over half the birth in our state. So we recognize the value of providing this as a covered benefit in the Medicaid program and the impact that we hope to achieve with uh, the use of doula services. So we did have a budget proposal and state legislation to help us um, in terms of advancing this policy as a covered Medicaid benefit. And in starting our journey on developing the benefit, we did uh, solicit um, input for um, individuals that would be interested in serving on a work group to help inform the development of the benefit under the Medi-Cal program. And within that convening, um, we also um, formed a small advisory communications team and they kind of served as um, a key resource to the state as well as the doula community writ large in terms of helping to bridge the discussions that we were having um, as we were working through um, the basic logistics of the development of our benefit in California. And with some of the things that we started to experience early on, we recognized early on that it was really important for us to bring to the table an expert meeting facilitator. Um, and I'll get into some of the reasons why we did that. So next slide, please. So how did we do? Well, when we first started down this journey, um, we had significant challenges with communication. So the one thing I would like to share with everyone is that communication is key. I think we all came to the table with the intent of doing the right thing, but when we first started down this journey, uh, we spoke Medicaid language, our doula population spoke doula language. We were not hearing one another. Um, we also encountered some challenges and understanding for how the benefit needed to be developed. So it was important to listen to our doula partners that came to the table. Another really big sticking point, and Amy had alluded to this in her earlier comments, were around the payment for covered benefits. Um, when we first uh, put the policy in our budget for um, discussion and approval by the, the state legislature, we had identified a bundled rate that was used by another state as a starting point. That just stopped all discussions because again, um, the doulas that were with us at the table felt like that was not a meaningful um, reimbursement rate for reimbursement for the services and the support that they do provide to individuals. And based upon just their, their input and feedback, 
it helped us to move forward in terms of developing a reimbursement rate that was a bit more acceptable to our doula um, community. And then also developing a benefit that was informed by the experience and learnings of people that actually do this work. You know, we come from a world of medical services. And so doula services are like the 360 degree opposite of the work that we would normally do in a Medicaid program. So we wanted to make sure that we were developing a benefit that was best in class but a benefit that was truly informed by, you know, our doulas that came to the table in our um, work group effort. So in terms of lessons learned, and I put this, you know, not to be really tongue in cheek, but it was really about listen, Linda, listen. Um, we came to the table, we were speaking Medicaid language, our doulas were speaking doula language. It was as if one of us was speaking French, one of us was speaking Russian and we were expecting each other to hear and understand what we were talking about. And that just created a lot of tension. It created a lot of distrust because people just did not understand, you know, like the world in which we both were coming from. So the meeting facilitator helped to bridge those language gaps uh, between the doula community and the Medicaid agency. And also that small communications group that was brought to the table, that was as a desire for us to kind of move forward because we had recognized early on we were not doing that with the way in which we were um, engaging with one another. And then also wanting to make sure that as we were looking to develop this benefit, that we were also engaging key team members from our organization regarding the benefit. Next slide, please. The last thing I'll, I'll just touch on very briefly, and these are some, some points just to, to hit on in terms of the successes that we have achieved here in California. I think having leadership within your organization is really important, and also having a desire to work with people and hear people in this space in terms of the development of the benefit. We did receive financial support from one of our um, foundations here in the state to help with a meeting facilitator. And then also, as we have deployed the benefit, also looking at ways in which we can continue to support our doula partners um, in this effort. I am very proud to say our benefit went live January 1 of this year. And thus far, we have had 84 applications submitted to us. 44 of those applications have been approved. And, we're, um, and we have like 34 applications that are in the queue for being processed. So, I would say so far we have been successful, but we still have a long way to go, a lot of work to do, but the work has to be done um, in collaboration with our um, doula partners, as well as with our managed care plans, because that's where the bulk of the Medicaid services here in California um, are being provided. And what we are doing to help our managed care plans as they are working with and contracting with doula providers here in our state, is also putting together lessons learned from our experiences up front so that they are not creating some of the same challenges or, or encountering those challenges so that they can then have successful engagement with the doulas. So with that, I will turn it back over to Amy. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Renee. Um, so next, let's have Missy present. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so let me start by saying that I am a midwife and I'm a researcher and I am, uh, I live as an uninvited guest on the lands of the Kalapuya people in Western Oregon. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about finding our way in a system not built for us and talk about what we've done here in Oregon to build up the supports that enable uh, individuals to actually provide doula care in our state. So next slide. So in Oregon, we have a long history of legislation. The first bill passed in 2011, and then a series of bills that brought us to the place of being able to actually receive Medicaid reimbursement for traditional health worker doulas that get onto the state registry. Uh, when we started our program in 2018, so five years past that original House bill, or that 2013 House bill, only six doulas had been able to get onto the state registry. They were all 
white, college educated, and monolingual. So our program came together to ask, how can we identify the key barriers to getting uh, Medicaid populations connected to culturally and linguistically matched doulas? And how can we bring in the funding to remove some of the economic barriers that people were experiencing and actually being able to provide the care? So next slide. Uh, we started with a listening campaign and needs assessment where we tried to understand what the main barriers were to actually being able to provide care. That was incredibly helpful and it, it's so fun to hear these other uh, speakers because there's so much alignment. Um, out of that listening campaign, we heard actually all of the recommendations that Amy um, put up there about the need to be uh, self-led, to be community-led, that the key decision makers, you know, we heard from communities that those closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. So they wanted to see doula programs that were led by the communities that they were actually serving in. Um, in addition, there was a need for some expertise specifically around data collection and analysis of data so that improvements in the program could be evidence informed. Uh, also for help around grant writing and economic sustainability as well as some admin support. Um, the one additional uh, recommendation or desire that we really heard out of that listening campaign that, that wasn't on Amy's list is that participants talked a lot about how they want to be able to do this work in an atmosphere of love, joy, support, and respect, that they didn't want to have to ruin their own lives or their families' lives in order to work for this cause. And so wanting that community support around them to be able to do the work in a way that was fulfilling. So the goal of the Community Doula Program, um, we received our first grant in 2018. We've been running for five years, and our goal is to improve maternal and infant health outcomes for pregnant individuals and their families through the provision of culturally and linguistically matched doula services. We serve in three counties, and we have two kind of guiding principles. One is that we can't all be created equal if we can't get an equitable start in life, and that healthy communities start with healthy birth. So the rest of this presentation, we can go to the next slide. I'd like to spend some time showing you what we've learned. So as we try to identify, you know, each of these spaces where uh, in order for this to work, we would we would need to offer some supports. Um, we in Oregon have developed something we call a hub model, and they're not all identical. There's multiple hubs in Oregon. I'm going to share with you the way we've sorted out some of these barriers. And so in the center here, we have the uh, logo for the doula, community doula program. And so we think about that as a reminder to center uh, those made most vulnerable by systems of oppression. So those are the clients that we serve and the doulas that emerge from those same communities who are um, serving people with similar social and historical backgrounds. And then around the outside are all the steps that we've identified as potential barriers uh, that require supports um, to work effectively in Oregon. So it's in a circle because we learned pretty early on that these are things that need to be done over and over again. It's not a single pathway with a start and an end, but an ongoing uh, cycle. So here are some of the things that we learned we needed to have supports for in our state. The first was Actually, it's not the first because remember it's a circle, so it starts anywhere. But an important one is building referral relationships. We needed a way for clinicians, behavioral health, WIC, all of our partners and stakeholders to be able to send referrals to doula programs so that we could actually connect the people in need of doulas with the doulas who are ready to serve. We also needed to build the workforce. And so, like I said, when this program started, there was a very small number of doulas who'd actually made it onto the traditional health worker registry, making them eligible to receive Medicaid reimbursement. So in structuring our organization, we made sure to have our leadership team be reflective of the communities we would be serving. And because individuals in our program were already well-respected um, leaders and elders in their community, they were able to go into their own community and help with recruitment. So in our initial grant, we had hoped to recruit and train 30 individuals, so two classes of 15. Uh, and I remember our funder at the time said they thought that was a bit ambitious and that we wouldn't maybe be able to find 30 individuals who are willing to serve uh, for a reimbursement rate that was initially only $75 and then moved up to 350. And 101 individuals signed up for the first training. Uh, and 40% of those individuals came from traditionally underrepresented groups within doula communities, so Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color. The doulas in the program actually speak 11 languages. 
uh, we were able to then uh, provide doula training for free. So removing some of those barriers, we heard that individuals weren't able to get trained because doula training costs anywhere from $600 to $2,000, plus additional training required by the state um, that was either cost prohibitive or in two cases didn't actually exist. So there were required trainings that um, didn't exist. And so people were having to go to other states to locate those trainings. So as we move around the circle, what our team did is try to identify the frictions, the places where things weren't moving smoothly, and then gradually begin to tease those out so that each step or each portion of this hub could begin to work more efficiently and more effectively. We'll also say that around the doula training, we uh, initially had uh, pretty limited options in our state, uh, uh, two really wonderful trainers, but limited availability for training. Uh, and the doulas in our program uh, actually received a grant to modify um, a donor curriculum to make it more oriented towards the populations they were serving. And so I think uh, we have, I know in our state, but possibly nationally, we have the first community-led doula developed curriculum that's been approved by the state and, and is actually being used to train doulas in Western Oregon now. We developed a system for matching clients to doulas. The system's called Vishnu. It's a elaborate system that allows connection uh, between doulas in terms of their areas of expertise and languages, for example, and the needs of the client. Mentorship programs, a lot of our doulas were initially worried about going to their first births. And so we have a program now where they can attend uh, births with a senior doula for their first three births um, until they feel comfortable providing care. We provide support for doulas to get on the traditional health worker registry and to get Medicaid credentialing. The registry in Oregon is designed to take six weeks um, to get onto, but in practice it takes a year and doulas are not able to bill for Medicaid during that time. So the hub um, steps in and grant rights and pays doulas through grants uh, until they're able to actually get onto the registry. And like I said, it takes about a year to get onto the registry. We're also collecting data, analyzing it, and using an iterative process to feedback on how to improve um, the project and how to really meet the needs of the doulas and the clients in the program. Continuing education is also required, but few options are available and especially few low or no cost options. And so we've worked to create those. Reflective supervision is a reform of supportive peer review where doulas can learn from one another and build community. And I'll say this has been probably what we've heard from doulas is that one of the most important pieces of the hub model um, and that they're not doing the work alone, that they have these collaborations and the support from being in a professional association where they're around other doulas and can debrief, they can back one another up, um, they can share client loads and uh, learn from one another. And this was very important for sustaining the program um, through the isolation that came with uh, the pandemic. We've also had to figure out how to manage um, some complaints. We haven't had to terminate any contracts with doulas, but in our state, we're required to know how we would do that if that needed to happen. And then the most difficult thing that we've really faced is figuring out how to bill. Um, billing is a major issue for us. Oregon has been wonderful about working with us to continually increase the compensation rate, but the time it takes from the time our hub bills until the doulas actually get paid is um, so long that doulas, this is a place where we um, have doulas attritioning out of the program. So again, our program covers their costs and then we reimburse ourselves after billing is successful. And then we can also help uh, with recertification support. So in Oregon, uh, this is kind of what we've learned that, that you can't just cross your fingers and hope that passing legislation will enable doulas to get uh, into contact with and provide care to the communities most in need and also be able to sustain that through billing. There need to be these other supports. So we like to say in our program that we have figured out a model um, that works. We have trained now close to 200 doulas and have about half of the doulas that are on the registry in Oregon actually have come through this process. So we know it works and it's been successful. Um, the problem is figuring out how to continue to uh, sustain the cost of it. So with that, I will, we can go to the next slide. And this is just to invite you all to come and take a look at the program, see the, the amazing doulas and the leadership team that guide this program. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Missy, and to all our presenters. Um, so we're going to, oh, um, 
I think this is, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to continue. Okay. Um, so we're going to just change gears a little bit, uh, moving on to just sort of the moderated panel discussion portion. Um, you know, I'm hoping there's a lot of good questions that have come up in the q and I'm kind of looking through here. So um, I'm going to sort of change plans a little bit and just move straight into our direct questions, our direct individual questions for each of the panelists. And then I'm hoping, um, if the panelists can keep your answers short, one to two minutes, um, if possible, I'm hoping to be able to work in maybe a couple of questions that have come up um, from the audience as well. So we're gonna start with a question for Sarah. Sarah, can you talk about some of the challenges that MassHealth has faced in considering how to implement Medicaid coverage for doula care? And in particular, I'm interested in hearing um, whether or not MassHealth has been able to really leverage some of the organizing and strategizing that doulas and other state advocates um, in the state have done in the past few years around Medicaid coverage for doula care. Sure, thanks, Amy. Um, I'll try to give a, a very quick answer, though I could talk about this for a while. Um, I also just wanted to point out quickly that um, unlike many of the states that currently cover doula services, Massachusetts doesn't have a bill or legislation that has passed as of yet that requires doulas to be covered under Medicaid in Massachusetts. So in other words, we don't have what's called legislative authority to cover doulas, um, which may, may very well change in the near future. Um, but that being said, MassHealth decided a few years ago that we were going to move forward with covering doula services in the absence of legislative authority. Um, I think in terms of the challenge, the way that I would frame the overarching challenge, uh, which really is a question, is you know, covering doulas through Medicaid requires integrating doulas into the system as imperfect as that system is um, to a certain extent in a way that they haven't been previously. So the, the question that we really are grappling with at MassHealth is how do we do that in a thoughtful way that honors the uniqueness of the doula profession and the unique characteristics of doula work that make it so impactful? while also centering the needs of the pregnant and birthing people that we're serving, who would otherwise be unable to afford doulas, um, and then all the while working within the realities of being a state Medicaid agency that is bound by federal and state laws and regulations. Um, we're thinking a lot about the doula workforce. How are we going to make sure that we have a workforce of doulas who meet the needs of our diverse members in terms of geography, race, ethnicity, language, et cetera, um, and I'll just briefly say in terms of um, the second part of the question, um, you know, as I alluded to earlier, we've, we've been engaging in a lot of robust um, engagement, not only with our community doulas, but folks in the community overall, um, and trying to, to get as much input as we can. Um, and once the benefit goes live, hopefully later this year, our work continues, um, and we know that there are going to be challenges and roadblocks, but we're really committed to tackling those along with the Massachusetts dual community and other stakeholders. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, my next question is for Renee. You know, Renee, as you discussed, really the California Department of Healthcare Services met with stakeholders for really over a year before the dual Medicaid benefit went live this past January. Um, how do you think the benefit as it was ultimately ultimately implemented was different because of these stakeholder meetings, if indeed it was? Thank you for the question, Amy. It was different. I think we came into this thinking, oh, it'll be easy. We kind of know what we want to do. We looked at other state Medicaid programs. We didn't know what we didn't know. Um, in California, there is no regulating body for doulas, so they came from different venues throughout the state. There are some that work with certain organizations, and so we learned a lot. And I think from those learnings and our ability to hear, they we had gotten to a place with that meeting facilitator where we could hear one another. I think it really helped to better inform our policy and to make it a policy that would fit and meet the needs of the doulas that work here in the state of California. Um, I think that given that working relationship that we had with them and trying to take the time that we could to get the benefit developed, I think it will be easier from an implementation perspective um, in terms of the ability for the doulas that are already doing this work, because that was the whole thing. We, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. 
and we really want to learn from them about the things that were important and then how we describe the services because Amy you had made a comment about like the full spectrum doula so they did share with us like there are doulas that work in the prenatal period those that work in the postpartum period those that cover both periods of care those were things that we were not necessarily tracking to so I think ultimately it really helped us to better inform the policy. It also helped us in terms of the um, state plan amendments that we had to file with the federal government in terms of getting their review and approval to give us the flexibility that we needed to have, you know, in terms of what's federally required, we met those requirements and then where we can continue to work and build and develop it through policy guidance on the ground. So I think it was it was invaluable having that voice at the table in terms of helping us in the development of that benefit. And again, we're we're not doulas. We're state Medicaid policymakers. And so us trying to develop something that we did not have the experience in, I think would have been detrimental um, to the populations that we have a responsibility for here in California if we had done that without having their voice at the table. Thank you, Renee. Um, and then my next question is for Missy. Um, you know, Missy, you spoke a lot about the doula hubs and that have been developed in Oregon. Can you tell us a little bit more specifically about um, what you feel are the advantages of the doula hubs specifically for sustainability purposes? Yes. So, you know, when you when you think about that hub model and all those different aspects. And, and identifying where those points of friction were, those are all places where we were losing doulas, where doulas were attritioning out of the process out of sheer frustration. Um, so you can imagine if you are, uh, you know, we're very careful about recruiting doulas that are, like I said, are matching the community that they serve in. If, if you're an English language learner and you have a form that's, you know, hundreds of questions long that you've got to fill out in order to get onto the traditional health worker registry that this can be a deterrent. And so each of these pieces having someone who's working it out and we, we actually paid staff to figure it out. And what that does is enables doulas to be doulas instead of being caught up in the bureaucracy, I guess, you know, for us, we're in, we're in the midst of, of doing this and it's it's gratifying because we we have over five years figured out, you know, each of these, I will say, like I said, we still struggle with the billing, but even that is beginning to to come to fruition. Um, you know, part of us questions like, do we actually want to have this much bureaucracy around creating doulas um, and getting doulas to have access to care? I think that's a really important question for all of us to figure out. I know we need quality control and it's important to be able to have credentialing processes. Um, but sometimes when I'm you know, in, in a room and we're getting ready to start a doula training and we're just going around and I'm hearing who's in the room, I think, gosh, they're, they're already doulas, just their desire to be here and serve in their own communities and bring their own experiences. Um, I know they're going to be going down a two-year process to get ready to be able to serve and perhaps turn this into a career. And I just think we should be really thoughtful about how big we want that bureaucracy to be. Because if it's large like that, you are going to need to figure out ways to fund the hub supports to make that possible. We know from surveying our doulas that 95% said they would leave if they didn't have a hub that they are not going to figure out how to build Medicaid. They are not going to figure out recredentialing. Um, and they're not able to bring in sufficient clients on their own to make a living. And so, um, you know, if, if, if this is the direction we're going, we need to really think about how we build in those supports to make it possible. Um, great. Thank you, Missy. So we have a couple of, um, just a few more minutes here to... Um, to kind of uh, ask a couple more questions. Um, can each of you share, and maybe I think we can go in the same order, Sarah, Renee, and then Missy. Um, can each of you talk about what are some important considerations for states in determining reimbursement rates and maybe what, um, maybe a bit about sort of how that discussion has gone in each of your states. And again, let's start with Sarah. Sure, uh, so this again, it would be a, a much longer conversation um, and Massachusetts doesn't yet have an established reimbursement rate. There's a whole process in terms of um, promulgating regulations, which involves a public hearing where folks from the public have the opportunity to comment on rates and provide feedback, et cetera. 
Um, but that being said, I can I can share some of the some of the key considerations and guiding principles that we've been thinking about in terms of reimbursement rates. Um, and of course, you know, stakeholder engagement, talking to doulas, um, learning from other states, et cetera, all the things we talked about earlier um, are part of that. But specifically, I would say, you know, one is around avoiding barriers to timely payment for doulas. So for example, you know, while um, a physician may be able to wait um, a year or however long they wait to get paid, um, recognizing that doulas from the community, um, we really want to make sure that they can get paid in a timely manner um, as much as possible and avoid barriers to that. Um, secondly, is in terms of allowing flexibility based on the member's unique needs. So, you know, each member, some members might want for prenatal visits, birth support, and no postpartum. Another person may want only labor support, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so really allowing for flexibility um, for that doula care to be provided based on the member's unique needs. Um, and then thirdly, I would just say, and this, I think Amy made this point earlier, that we need to recognize that doulas are one of the many pieces of the puzzle. So, you know, in Massachusetts, doulas will be one of many covered services that members may need during pregnancy, birth, and the postpartum period. Um, they are not the only solution. Um, and we need to make sure that members have or families have wraparound services um, that include but are not limited to doula care. And in California, um, we have first started looking at a bundle that was not satisfactory. Where we ultimately landed um, was looking at reimbursement rates that we pay our other licensed providers that provide prenatal and postpartum care. So that's where we landed in terms of the reimbursement rates for our doula um, providers in the medical program. And we did not, um, uh, change those rates, what we wanted to recognize was the time that is spent by the doulas with the individuals in terms of how we came up with the rate structure that we did. Uh, we also allow for um, flexibility with the number of visits that can be provided. Our um, visits will support um, the, um, the birth outcome. So whether that's with you know a live birth, if there's a miscarriage, if there may be a pregnancy termination, there is still a reimbursement rate that then gets tied with that support for that individual. And then we also have the ability, um, and our services are provided based upon the recommendation by a licensed provider. Our doulas in California are not required to be supervised by a licensed provider, but their services must be provided based upon a recommendation by a licensed provider. So to the extent that they have that recommendation, then they can bill for up to, I think it's like 11 visits initially starting, you know, for you look at your uh, prenatal postpartum uh, visits and then the labor and delivery visit. And then if there's some additional visits, like some extended um, postpartum visits that are needed for that individual based upon what their needs are, then they can have those visits also reimbursed. Um, through a federal waiver that we just secured for the provision of um, justice involved services for Medicaid services for justice involved populations. One of the requirements in that um, waiver is to also look at some of our provider reimbursement rates and to bring them up to 80% of Medicare. Our maternity rates is one where we're below that. So even with the existing rate structure, through the legislative process and federal approvals, we will also be putting on the table increased reimbursement rates that will take us up to 80% of Medicare and the doula reimbursement rates will fall into that. So there will be an additional bump in the reimbursements for the services that are being provided to them. And I just have a little bit to add to that. I would say that in Oregon, in addition to what we've already heard about, we were also guided by a 2019 study by Grainer and colleagues that was in the Journal of Midwifery and Women's Health. So it was a cost effectiveness study that showed uh, that doulas were cost effective up to about $1,200. We in the state really think about that as sort of the floor and not the ceiling of what doulas can make because we don't necessarily want to fall into 
the pit of thinking doulas have to be cost effective um, in order to justify being able to serve. It's very much more the case, we think, that we need to invest. We'll have to spend money to get the kind of equitable outcomes that we want to have. And so we don't want to put it back on doulas to make sure that they're that they're serving the system and saving the system money um, as the only indicator of how much we pay them. Um, but I think that that study was really helpful and helping us to push that, um, that reimbursement rate up to the 1500 Thank you everyone for sharing. Um, so we're gonna close with one last question. I'm gonna ask you guys to keep this one to like maybe a couple of sentences, 30 seconds or less. Um, could each of you share um, just what you're most proud of um, in your state around its efforts to expand access to doula care? And again, just um, really quick responses. Um, we'll start with Sarah again. Sure. Yeah. So Amy, uh, Amy's recommendation, one of the recommendations in the beginning was take the time to get it right from the beginning. Um, and so I'm really proud that in Massachusetts, I think we are taking the time to leverage all of the, the things we talked about earlier um, to make sure that we are developing the best policy we possibly can, um, both for our members and also for doulas. And I think adding on to what Sarah just said, um, it was taking the time to get it right and listening. I think when we first started, we were like this, we were butting heads, we were going nowhere. And we were like, what are we going to do? Having that small group of, of the, a communications team to first meet with the department, kind of understand the rules of engagement, they would take that information, translate it back to the larger work group. Then when we got into the larger work group meetings, we were better prepared in terms of responding to questions and concerns. At the end of our process, to hear the meeting facilitator to say, do you hear and see the smiles that we are having? And just at the end, you know, we all use the little emoji. We were having heart at the end of the meetings that we were having when those work group efforts you know, were coming to a close. For us, that was a huge, huge accomplishment in terms of the value of effective communication and using a meeting facilitator. And we just have a, a much different respect for one another in terms of our roles and responsibilities. So we were really able to both listen and to hear one another. And for that, I think we're much better in terms of our work and you know moving forward with the implementation of this benefit. Thank you. I would say there's a lot that we're proud of and excited about here, but I think for us it's that since we've been at it now for about five years, we have a big enough sample size to actually be looking back at what some of the impacts are. And that's been incredibly rewarding. And I want to have a big shout out here to the midwives in our state who are some of the earliest adopters of the doula program and are our most consistent referrers. And we've just been, you know, we anticipated really positive outcomes, but when you actually pair midwives with culturally and linguistically matched doulas to provide uh, care, what we're seeing in our state is that not only can you reduce the inequities that begin at birth, you can completely eradicate them. And that's exciting for us. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. And Yanti, I'm passing it back to you. Thank you, Amy. And thank you so much to everyone who presented today. Um, it was just, the presentations were just so great. Um, I know we were not able to get the participant questions and we talked about that at the beginning of today's session, but we will definitely get those answered and sent out to you all in the post-session materials once we compile them and get responses from um, the panelists. So at the beginning of the learning series, we provided all participants with the topics for sessions one through six, but we left session seven and eight as to be determined. Um, we want to select these based off of the interests of the registered participants. Um, we've not been taking note of topics that you all, we have been taking note, note of topics that you all have expressed interest in during the Q&A chat and the feedback surveys. And we looked at all those ideas at which were very, very many. And we combined similar topics and um, compiled a list of topics that you'll see on your screen now for you to answer in the poll. Um, we would love to get your feedback. So in, when you see this poll on your screen, please choose the two topics you're most interested in. And we're gonna use that information to determine the topics for session seven and eight. Um, so I'm gonna give you about 15 seconds to finish this poll when you get a chance. Um, we're gonna also sh share a link to the um, feedback survey in the chat box for you to complete 
um, at the completion of this session. We really appreciate all of your feedback and your input. And I know we are at time, so I'm just going to, hopefully you all got, the, you can fill the link out for the chat. Please complete the poll um, before you leave. We appreciate everyone's time today. Session five of the learning series is gonna be capturing value and demonstrating impact in Medicaid. And it's gonna be on Thursday, April 6th at three o'clock Eastern time. Keep an eye out for the pre-session email with the agenda and required pre-session activities. And if you haven't already, please remember to add Jennifer Moore to your email contact list so you don't, so this is not sent to your spam. Um, her email is posted on the slide. Thank you again for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you at session five on April 6th. Thank you.